join us today. Well, good day, everybody, wherever you may be. To, um, welcome to this special, I suppose, pre-Halloween edition, which you can, I guess, either take as a trick or a treat, depending on whether you uh, order the popcorn in advance. So the topic uh, is, I guess, my topic, the future configuration management for continuous delivery, uh, which will be sort of a romp through some of the ideas that will be coming to a data center near you uh, anytime soon. In fact, looking from the poll, maybe some of these things are coming to you already. So hold on to your broomsticks, and we'll uh, dive through this uh, this talk quickly, and then hopefully get some feedback from, from everybody. So let me just uh, set the stage, uh, just mark out the canvas on which we're going to paint this picture. And I've got these two slides which kind of illustrate the transition that we're trying to get to. And it's kind of a shift, you know, industry, the business and the industry is taking a shift from uh, reaping the ad hoc fruits that you happen to find walking around the forest to a kind of a managed agriculture approach to infrastructure. So in the past, we've, we've sort of built infrastructure, as you may be uh, see, and it kind of grows, you know, as a forest might grow, and then you walk around picking mushrooms and berries or, or using what you can of what you've built. But the idea is really to, to move towards a much more um, predictable, efficient resource, uh, efficient way of managing uh, IT infrastructure, analogous to this sort of hydroponics farm, which I have on the right-hand side of these slides. And it even looks a bit like a data center with the rows of uh, of, uh, of plants there. And I think you know, one of the one of the key things about managing infrastructure in a predictable way is having good patterns and good configurations that uh, are conducive to efficiency. So let's take a step back and just say what configuration is, or what I understand at least in configuration. So just generally, I mean, configuration obviously is, is arranging things into a pattern. And that could be a very general uh, idea. Here's a lovely picture of some gardens in the UK. I'm originally from the UK, although I live in Norway now. Uh, we have in common with a few countries in the world fascination with gardens. And the configuration of these plants into a beautiful pattern could have either aesthetic or even functional value. Uh, in this case, probably both. And what you observe from this picture is that um, configuration can be perceived on a number of scales. You have the, the entire garden, or you can zoom in to a flower bed or a fountain, uh, get down, I think the expression we use in the industry is to be down in the weeds, but hopefully there are no weeds in this garden. This is just, just roses. So configuration can be perceived on a number of different scales. And the different scales have different purposes. So clearly it's important from the experience of the users down to the technical details and the engineering behind it. Um, another example of configuration management is this circuit board, which you know could be a radio or something like this. And what's important about this is the idea that when you get into configuration management with components, you can actually use commodity components, and you don't have to build everything from scratch. You don't have to grow every flower and dig every bed for yourself. You can buy off-the-shelf components and put them together into, to create a new thing, which is more than the sum of its parts. And this is also a theme which I think is, is becoming more uh, important in the industry today, that we're not trying to build everything from scratch, but we're trying to use more uh, commodity components to speed up uh, the delivery of the industry. And an important thing there is the idea of CAD CAM. Many of you remember the idea of CAD CAM from you know, even way back in the 80s when computer-aided design uh, was an important way of designing patterns like this, something we, we could actually learn from in, uh, in configuration management. So configuration could be used for all kinds of different purposes. What we're talking about today is uh, how to apply this to the problem of continuous delivery. And continuous delivery is important in a business sense because uh, it's really the basis of running a business without interruption and in a, in a seamless way 
uh, to, to really make the best of time and resources. Formally, I guess we could define continuous delivery in IT or software as a sort of continuous improvement process. You may know that from ITIL and other frameworks like COBIT and so on. But continuous improvement of software as a stream of releases rather than you know, long, uh, a couple of releases a year, but a continuous delivery of these releases in such a way that the software is all, always ready for use. I have this picture which I've I've been showing people since the mid 2000s for what this really really means, and I I like it because it it exemplifies actually bad timing with the explosion of the rocket today, uh, yesterday. It was very unfortunate. Exactly, that's exactly what I was seeing here. <laughs> yeah, my apologies for that. Um, but but actually, you know, rocket uh, symbolizes a project which takes a long time, a lot of expertise, and a lot of hard work to build. And it goes over months, possibly even years, to put together. And it's you have all of your eggs in one basket, and you get this one chance to stand up this thing. And sometimes it doesn't go according to plan, as we saw, unfortunately, yesterday. Um, and then translate that into the modern, so you could never make, you know, you can never make aviation out of rocket travel. But turn this into a 747, and you have the epitome of continuous delivery. You know, a, device, a, a machine which can be mass produced. It can be turned around several flights a day. It can go to new destinations. It can be, you can rip out the seats and put in cargo. It can carry a bunch of different payloads. So you have this very adaptable uh, device which now can be turned around many times a day and rehearsed literally in real time so that everything becomes super uh, well rehearsed and, and, and familiar to everybody involved and there's really nothing to hold up the process of sending somebody on a flight. Yeah, so this, this is, is the really, basis. Yeah, this is really a good analogy, Mark, and unfortunate timing in some respects, but you know, it's an analogy that Forrester calls the continuous delivery paradox and, and it's more like Faster, more regular delivery actually reduces risk, like you brought out here. And deploying daily or weekly instead of monthly and quarterly actually improves the quality because you get good at it, just like you said. Um, it's more repeatable. And and so the risk is actually at, in the process of implementing the change as opposed to the actual change. You know, implementing the change actually is more risk than the actual change itself, right? That's the idea, yeah, and I think that's a great, I think the, you know, we, we're, well, at least many of us are used to the idea of air travel now, and I think it gives a nice, just to see how efficient the airlines are in turning flights around today, it gives, it's a really inspirational uh, way to look at uh, delivery of business value. Alrighty, so um, there's one other thing which I think is important about infrastructure, which uh, configuration management and continuous delivery play into, and that is, even as you look at the poll, uh, just how many of us are still involved in building things, you know, not invented here syndrome, let's make our own instead of buying the commodity solution, the CAD CAM solution. And we tend to script things, we tend to write our own solutions Put together, put them together by hand, making us bricklayers rather than uh, users or, or planners. And if we could get out of this bricklaying frame of mind, which is very down in the weeds, uh, to more of a town planning kind of uh, focus, where you're thinking more about the usability of what you're building. For example, how easy is it for people to get in and out? How many I don't know, emergency exits are there. Are we making optimal use of sunlight? And uh, how does the energy come in? How is it shared? Are there meeting spaces for people? All of these kinds of human issues become much more, come much more into focus when we think about the architecture of a system from more of a town planning community kind of a level. If we're bricklayers, we're really not thinking about those things and we tend to be very blinkered and focused on that on the wrong level of, of abstraction to make a good customer experience. So I think that's uh, something we can learn a lot about. 
So a transition from building to decorating what we've built, if you like, or getting the most out of the design that we've come up with. And I like to use this idea of style sheets. How can we turn this very constructional process of ad hoc maintenance, again looking at the, the pole, into much more of a declarative structure, like as we have style sheets for HTML, we've separated the construction of the page from how we decorate it, which fonts we use, which colors we, we paint in, and so on. So if we could somehow declare, like a style sheet, how we want our infrastructure to behave, which servers are going to be for web servers, you know, which are database servers, and so on. At a very high level, it would be much simpler, and we would be much more like that sort of component, uh, reusable component view that I showed you in the CAD CAM picture. So that's kind of a, a thing. So I want I to break up this idea of continuity into uh, a couple of pieces, because I think there are a couple of ways to understand it. Continuity kind of has two aspects. You could call it service and content. Here I've broken it up into dev and ops, and the two ways that they uh, look at it. And continuity is really about maintaining expectations. And here I've kind of got space and time, if you like, or as dev and ops. On the operational side, continuity means can we keep the service running? Is it always available, uh, no matter where you are? And is the latency short enough that you're getting the data in a, you know, in a timely fashion? Whereas for a developer, it's slightly different. So then you're thinking continuity is about, if we make a change, is, is it continuously usable? Have I broken something, or is it? Is it continuing to function in the way that uh, that we want? Obviously, if you know a plane in midair, you don't want to be making too many changes because you want that you, that consistency of of a uh, function uh, to go on. In software, of course, that plays to not only usability but compatibility between different versions. And when we have multiple versions, can they coexist? So you know, some people never upgrade, right? Some people will be using, you know, where there are still people using Windows XP today, and, and that continues to coexist with with more modern operating systems. So these are aspects of of, um, of continuity. Then there's, I think, something which is quite important, which is um, convergence of desired state or what you intend to get out of your what you're trying to deliver, not just the continuity of delivery, but what you're trying to deliver. And again, dev and ops. So uh, on the operational side, you have configuration drift, which can happen for a whole bunch of reasons, either because you know humans are getting involved in, in fat fingering changes when they shouldn't be, or programs crash because of bugs. Yeah power failures, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons why things may may not be uh, uniform. Even consensus, so things like, um, what's the word, uh, eventual consistency in databases, you know, as you add data and it takes time to propagate around the system, to have convergence to a, a state which is uniform and usable for everybody. This is something which uh, leads to continuity of experience for the customers. And then on the development side, you may have unintended changes. You know, we make a mistake. Um, and there may even be emergent side effects once we put pieces of software together or put them into an environment, say, you know, a new cloud or an, um, there's an operating system upgrade which led to an unexpected side effect. All of these things can interrupt the continuity of the experience and lead to divergence. And so one of the keys to having uh, continuous delivery is to bring convergence, to be focused on convergence and this sort of desired goal and state. So there are these competing forces. I say convergence to a desired end state or having a new, what I would call a promised outcome. You make clear promises to your customers, and you deliver on those. So this uh, is yeah. the town. 
Go ahead, Moxie. Yeah, yeah, no, very interesting. Uh, I, I'm just thinking as, as a customer, as a consumer, uh, you know, how Apple has this continuity concept now uh, with iOS and OS X, you know, going from laptop to uh, iPad to phone, and, you know, making sure that experience is the same and how configuration management has to play the part across platforms and converge, you know, with that promise. So it really ties in as an actual use case. I think that's a great, uh, a great analogy. Apple, of course, has been extremely good at continuity or convergence of experience across devices and tying their devices into their services in a very user-friendly way. I think, in many ways, they kind of lead the way in that area. But so. It also reminds me of the town planning example that I had back at the beginning where, again, you're focusing on the, the customer experience or the user experience. You know, how do we get into a building? How do we get out of a building? Uh, is it nice and cool? Can we plug our laptops into the power sockets? Uh, as, a, as a British guy going to America, I have that problem, right? <laughs> the power sockets and the plugs don't match. So there's a whole bunch of things where we, we're trying to keep our promises to maintain continuity and uniformity of experience. And then, of course, there's the, the converse of that, which is the branching, which takes place when we're developing. And branching is important for improving things, so exploring new possibilities, developing new ideas, possibly even extending functionality. But the key to continuous delivery is to make sure that your explorations don't compromise the existing promises that you've made so that you have this continuous, this continuity of service as, you know, as time goes along. So, you know, we are the humans, I say. I think uh, there are human forces in this picture that guide the evolution of tools and processes in ways which sometimes we underestimate. In fact, I, I even claim that I've underestimated this myself over the years. I sometimes get um, uh, congratulated for inventing configuration management early on, but I think one of the things that I didn't see very clearly was how, how the human uh, trends and, uh, what's the word, um, how human habits would uh, cause us to delay our adoption of technology over time. And I think one of the key things there is this concept of identity inertia. We as humans strongly identify with the work that we do. You know, our jobs give us, to, to a large extent, a large part of our identity. And I think you see that significant innovation doesn't really happen until people can either find themselves a new identity which they're comfortable with or, or simply, you know, get out of the way of innovation uh, by changing their role. So people will cling on to what they're good at. We definitely see this in config management where in the olden days you would be slaying dragons on the command line with orc and sad and, you know, uh, today, still, the tendency is to log in by hand and start typing, whereas... Yeah, on top of that, I just wanted to add, you know, that on top of that, you know, organizations have to build this tremendous amount of, like, operational knowledge, but most of it's kept in the heads of the IT specialists. So it, it, it becomes, you know, that there's a ten, you know, they have a tendency to change jobs from time to time. And so you have this sort of knowledge uh, waste or, or loss uh, that that organizations lose. So you know, how do we transform that as well, right? Well, that's a great point. I'm actually coming back to that in in a little bit because I think that knowledge piece is one of the key things that we're really underestimating today. In fact, if I go back to uh, when I started the CF Engine company as opposed to the open source project, you know, which goes back 20 years. But the, the company in 2008 was founded on the idea that uh, knowledge management would become an important part of configuration management as the complexity grew. Well, I'll come back to that uh, in a sec. So anyway, um, culture is what I'm saying really is an important issue here, which 
plays into the way we think about the problem of infrastructure. And this little cartoon that I drew here, I think, tries to show that a little bit. Um, you know, you've got a few paradigms which we have in our minds, like um, centralized pops, points of presence, you know, shops that we visit, um, places where we go to do our business, totem poles, if you like, places where we visit a particular location in order to obtain service. Even uh, a web, a web page, is a singular, centralized thing. And then there's the, the behind-the-scenes story, which is a very decentralized story, uh, which is um, more like a factory de delivering the service, delegating it to a whole bunch of people. Then we have, of course, the mobile experience. We have uh, the resource allocation experience, which is kind of like you know lots of little ants trying to fill in cells and allocate uh, blocks of storage. And you've got your storage part also, which is you know the gigantic archive or library. You've got your disaster recovery scenarios for the dinosaur killing asteroids that come and hit you on the head. Uh, you've got your planes in flight communicating with satellites, and these are kind of things that we have in mind now because this is the world that we live in. My suspicion is that as we move into the next generation of the next 10 years, because of just the sheer proliferation and the, the sheer scale um, of this, uh, call it enterprise, this is all going to break up and spread out across the surface of the world so that um, it's no longer just in a few data centers somewhere, but we're having you know, cloud substations at the end of your street where you can get service more, more quickly because what's important now is something like latency. The fact that transmitting data halfway across the world to an Amazon data center in, in you know, Seattle or something takes way too long if you're in the middle of India. So you want to build infrastructure closer to the, the users who are using it, and that means optimizing and bringing, uh, spreading it out, decentralizing it. That brings you know additional problems, like how do we address all of these different things? How do we connect them together? And the thing that everybody always forgets is how do we garbage collect the stuff that we've created so that we're not sitting on an ever-growing pile or mound of junk uh, which we just uh, which becomes you know, a cost or a burden. So there are these themes that always come back to us in in uh, in infrastructure, which is centralization and decentralization, which is super important, and we're still confused about them. I think the reason for centralizing stuff is is the human aspect, this the human interaction piece that I mentioned, you know, the point of presence, the point of service the branch of your bank that you visit to pay in your money, the shop that you visit to get the personalized service, the phone call that you make to a person. This is, these are central localized things. They give us our sense of identity, of belonging. They are they represent our home, our local, and, and the things that we intend. And then there's the sort of the machine-like, call it dehumanized view of that, which is, the machines underneath, you know, the Morlocks down below that are making all of this society work, uh, which include the servers, replication of services, the logistics of delivery, um, the arrays of storage. These things are non-local or spread out. And associated with that is not necessarily intentional behavior, but emergent behavior. And I believe very strongly that in the future, emergent behavior is something we have to take seriously and deal with in a new way that we've never really considered too much in the past. Um, I like to use an analogy, centralization, decentralization. Centralized model is a brain model. And organizations with brains are basically like uh, organisms. So here are a few organisms that have brains, and you see that you know, brains give things a sense of identity. They give things a certain intelligence, and they they allow decisions to be made quite quickly. But they don't scale terribly well. Uh, here you see, you know, humans down below. But the biggest animal with a 
with um, with a brain is probably the blue whale, which isn't that much bigger than a human. The point is that you simply cannot send the signals from the brain back and forth fast enough to scale uh, to a terribly large organism. So if you're having that level of intelligent control, either your organism is a company or uh, a specific service or, or whatever it is, you're kind of constrained in, in the scalability of it, and it's a brute force scaling, so-called vertical scaling. But the alternative, of course, is what I would contrast to a brain model called a society model, or a, a swarm, as they call swarm intelligence. And here it's much more about emergent cooperation. You delegate to small um, agents which carry out the work, and they do their pieces, and as a result of each doing their thing without too much centralized control, they manage to keep this whole thing together and cooperate in extraordinary ways. So the question really becomes, you know, how and where do we want to live? Um, what kind of pattern do we want for ourselves as human beings? How do we want to interact with this infrastructure? What kind of infrastructure do we want to make? What kind of a world do we want to make? Our future begins with those decisions. And they include things like, do we want to decentralize into a bunch of microservices like ants? Or do we want to create a single totem pole like uh, you know, point of presence that we <laughs> worship like a brain model? You know, are we going to be builders? Are we going to be town planners? Are we going to be consumers? Are we going to be like remote control junkies in front of the TV? trying to remote control infrastructure by, you know, remote shell execution or, or whatever, or, or are we going to take a back seat and specify policy and let the automation take care of it more like a style sheet? So these are the decisions that will influence the way we build infrastructure in the next generation. And I think this describes what I would think of as a storyline, which is you know, what is the story we are trying to tell to our users, to our customers, what experience do we want them to have, and how do we want to implement that? We're not terribly good at distinguishing between the story that we want to tell, the narrative we want to create, and how it gets implemented in practice. We tend to think in terms of stories as humans, and then that forces us to sort of enact those stories in practice, which um, means that we don't always do things terribly efficiently. So if we could separate those things, we could scale um, to more of these society models, which more of these town planning models, which scale much better, horizontal scaling, as we call it. So then there's the issue of tenancy. You know, where do you want to live? Now, we often have this point of presence. We talk to this one tree, but the forest is large. Uh, it's full of trees. Maybe we should be thinking about it in a slightly different way. or to put in IT terms, you know, where do we want to put our workloads? Where do we want to put our data? Um, perhaps we'll be actually carrying our own data, personal data, on our bodies in the future. I mean, why keep it in the cloud when it's only us that needs it? For privacy, it would be much better to keep it close to us rather than having it floating around the ether. So we need to re rethink the way, where and the when we put things. And this is about now going beyond mere automation to set things up. It's about how do we organize data, avoid sending huge months, amounts of data over the network if, if it could stay still, move compute to data instead of data to compute. And this comes back to your point, Mark, about knowledge, because there are these three challenges as I see them. One is scale, which is increasingly about horizontal scale. That leads to complexity because of just the sheer number of things. And that, of course, leads to this problem of knowledge. How do we know, understand, comprehend this monster that we've created, which is now spread out all over the place? It's more of a jungle than, a, than a, an organism. Um, here, of course, IT itself has its own ideas. And we tend to, sep we tend to confuse separation of concerns with reduction of complexity. This idea that keeping things tidy and putting things into neat boxes, delegating, separating, is actually a strategy to 
to work against complexity. In fact, it's the opposite. As we separate things uh, into multiple items, and then if they're not really separate, but they, they still need to talk to each other, in fact, we just increase the number of things we have to deal with. So we need to understand that better. And here's a great example of a billboard, the kind that are cropping up all over Europe now. These are interactive Android devices, um, basically giant pads that people interact with. They don't sit on a, a, a super high capacity network, so they, they need to be basically autonomous devices with light, weak coupling to some central location or decentralized location. They are basically autonomous entities and to manage these things. We need a new kind of paradigm, much more of a society paradigm, decentralized paradigm, than that central brain model that, uh, that we're looking at. So what is it that allows us to handle complexity? And you know, I think this is obviously a huge discussion that uh, we can just sketch the beginning off here, but it, it goes way beyond what we have time for today. But the key is to keep couplings between parts weak so that we're not strongly dependent on things that we possibly may be cut off from, resources that we, we, we don't have available. So these principles of atomizing things, making things independent like ants instead of an organism, and keep them light and simple, keyword being autonomous. This was the CF engine philosophy. Keep all the agents autonomous, separate as much as possible. Decentralize things and untether them. In other words, don't have strong dependencies that tie things together because that makes things brittle. If things are strongly tied together, when one thing fails, it drags down the next thing and the next thing like a house of cards or a chain of dominoes. And this is really important because, you know, our, our desire for mobility and flexibility is driving us to have this untethered experience. This uh, freedom to work and live wherever we want to is really pushing us to um, design systems that are less strongly coupled. And, and this is going to be an essential thing when we come to configuration management and continuous delivery. How do we deliver things to something which is all over the place? So separation of concerns with strong coupling actually increases complexity. It doesn't decrease it. And well, developers have seen this as well in the way that code becomes terribly complex as uh, you know increasing number of modules which are tied very strongly together. And so for that reason, I would say beware, you know, orchestration people claiming to do orchestration which is very decentralized from a central location because that is trying to apply a brain model to something which is more like a, a jungle, very difficult to, to achieve, doesn't scale terribly well. And this is the reason why. I think you know, the emergent ecosystem, this is probably what our data centers and IT systems are going to be looking like in the not too distant future. Some, to some extent, perhaps they already do. And we have to simply get used to this idea that uh, it's not going to look like a beautiful diamond in the next few years. There really will be all of these cross connections and ecosystems of services, call them microservices, interacting with each other in their own little niche, but collaborating towards you know, the purpose of the whole. And this perhaps seems a little odd because we think you know, as humans, we have this predilection for tidiness, but there's nothing more robust than a rainforest as an ecosystem. It's super diverse. It's very robust to all kinds of impacts. Even human beings, when they come with their machines, they, they do pretty well. So we mustn't confuse tidiness with resilience. I think this is an important lesson for the future. And similarly, we shouldn't confuse untidiness with disorder. We shouldn't think that jungle is a mess. It's in fact a remarkably uh, well-designed system. And just as an example of that, just as we're coming to the end, I think I wanted to show this picture because for me this is the epitome of something that we do rather badly because of our human habits and, and prejudices. 
with a picture of a data center, obviously, showing you the networking cables just to connect all of the servers together. And I, I claim that the reason we, we have all of this folding spaghetti is that we designed data centers in rows and columns and cu with a cubic structure because we think that way as human beings. And here is, you know, the design of a, of a network. This is a, a cloth, fat tree, two by two infrastructure. And you'll see it's designed to have a certain resilience. It's designed uh, to carry data and be very scalable and have small failure domains. It's designed pretty well, actually, to do the job that it has. But it's really not a cubic structure. And if we actually just think more like a mathematician instead of a, a data center designer. What we see here is if we unravel it a little bit, just redraw it slightly, is not a, a row and column structure, but in fact a radial structure. So that if we just fold this around a torus, we start to see rays. We can redesign the whole thing so that it's a radial structure like this. And then there's not a single cable folded or bent. This is all line of sight communication, exactly the same structure redesigned. The whole thing completely unravels. And you could imagine a future data center in which there are simply laser beams instead of cables, you know, cable fibers that go brittle after a certain time and all the heat. You simply use laser beams and maybe a couple of mirrors to, to bring uh, the laser beams to their targets. Stuff astronomers are good at, you know, Go talk to the astronomers at the observatory. They can show you how to build this thing. And we could simplify the whole of that infrastructure and make it more robust, more reliable, probably a lot smaller, and you know, just change the whole configuration for greater efficiency. So that's just one example, I mean, of how human attachment to human ways of thinking possibly cause us to choose suboptimal solutions and make more work and complexity for ourselves. Whereas a simple mad redesign, a new kind of policy, can actually simplify the whole problem enormously. And I think this is what we're going to have to do in the future, just from the sheer scale of things that we're dealing with. So, you know, the future, I think it's about balancing this need for exploring new possibilities with the need for continuous delivery, the need for con continuity of service in both development and operations, uh, having these targeted outcomes so that we, re we retain focus, we know what we're trying to achieve. And similarly, the customer is not being thrown off target by changes that we make on the fly. Uh, we can automate systems in a way that makes the automation literally executable documentation. And this plays into your um, knowledge base, uh, your knowledge aspect as well, Mark, that, that the documentation and the automation become one. They become the same thing. And that's the move to, again, going back to the poll at the beginning, the shift from the ad hoc to the declarative, and why the declarative end state becomes the documentation without all the bricklaying in between. So we end up with the town plan instead of the bricklaying process and we're focused on the customer experience as we should be. So I think if we can get to that, that allows us to watch out for human storyline and delegate the bits that uh, need to be delegated to the correct parts, whether it's an automation or a, a human um, working on the back end or at the point of service end. And that's uh, basically what will take us to the next next generation of configuration management. Yeah, excellent, Mark. Yeah, you know, this is interesting, uh, the need, and I think the, the human factor, the need of, of a strong connection, you know, of that strong coupling, but, but like you said, complexity and scale, the cost of it. Because if you have a connection, you, then you want it, you need to know the state you know, the heartbeat, and and you want to connect. If you connect with many, many things, that becomes quite expensive. Absolutely. That's the brain conundrum, yeah? That's, uh, that's basically why organisms don't grow very, very big, because 
all of that nerve traffic back to the brain would become so so much of a burden it would just become uh, it would just choke uh, eventually and it would take too long I sometimes use the analogy of an orchestra as well you know how how an orchestra scales uh, if you look at the size of an orchestra it, it, it never really grows much beyond you know, say 30 feet across or um, if it tried to grow more than that, that the sound, the time it would take the sound for, to go from one end of the uh, room to the other would be noticeable. So that the time delay would become noticeable and coordination becomes difficult. You know, light speed is much faster, obviously, but uh, we still have issues of latency making coordination of a wide area is into a, an issue. And eventual consistency is one of one example of that. Yeah, and and uh, then you know you you pull in uh, the complexity, like you mentioned. You know, it's no longer integration management is no longer just about servers, right? You you know, and and the boundaries of the enterprise, in some ways, are no longer just within that organism, right? It it extends, uh, you know, across to you know BYOD. To like you mentioned, uh, other cloud services, outsourcing, so the configuration, the continuity uh, tends to drive the complexity and the scale tremendously high, uh, which causes you know again this connection uh, con conundrum issue. So, sounds like autonomy uh, might be the ticket. That's certainly the cheap option. Um, I think we never really escape the need for centralization because what centralization gives you is the ability to make comparisons in a single location and those comparisons give you the, the intelligence to make decisions so bringing data together in a, in a single place allows you to make comparisons calibrations decisions but it costs so it's a fairly expensive operation and what I think is interesting is to go back to the data center example, just see how much of the services we actually run on are, in fact, emergent phenomena. We kind of imagine that you know, computer science still sort of believes in determinism for some reason, but you know, the economy, the internet, all of these things that we rely on every day are, are very much uh, non-deterministic things that are very decentralized. Just the delivery of a packet from you know, my voice arriving, being spread out to everybody in the audience. Packets going over a network. There's nothing deterministic about that whatsoever. Interesting, Carl. Do we have uh, questions? I know we got we're, we got about eight minutes left at the top of the hour, <laughs> and of course there's customer uh, attendees that would love to uh, ask some questions to Mark. Yes, absolutely, and, and thank you, Mark and Mark. Um, great presentation. I want to remind our attendees that you can ask questions of Mark or Mark uh, by uh, typing them into the Q&A uh, window in WebEx, and uh, we, we've got a few minutes here to answer some questions, so do type in. Um, let's see, let's, looking at what's come in so far, uh, bear with me here as I look through the list. Um, and while those questions come in, I want to uh, take this opportunity to remind our uh, attendees today that we will continue our DevOps drive-in series next month. Uh, we do these every month, so next month, November 20th, and we're going to talk about, uh, as you see here on the slide, accelerating application delivery with continuous testing. Uh, with our partners at SOSTA. So uh, look for an email invitation uh, about that coming into your inbox in the next uh, week or so. Uh, let's see. Um, Mark and Mark, I think you have visibility to the questions as well. So let me know if you see something in there. Um, uh, I, here's one. I, I, yeah, oh, go what, ahead, Mark. I, I like uh, what types of roles and skills do you see emerging in this new future, Mark? Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, 
So did you want to answer that one, Mark, or do you want me to answer that? You're the expert. We're going to turn to you. <laughs> uh, expert is overrated. No, um, no, I think that's a great, uh, a great question. And I go back to this idea of the town planner, which I think is a much more important role, perhaps an un underestimated role, how we get that shift of mindset from being the bricklayer to the, to the town planner. The bricklaying is going to be done by robots, uh, automation devices. You know, whether it's something like CF Engine, which is building servers on the fly, or if it's something like, um, you know, Docker, where you're constructing um, images in, up front from a version control system, whatever approach you use, you basically need to have an idea of how you're, you're painting this picture on a canvas, and that is very much an architecture role. I, I went to college with a lot of architects when I was, uh, you know, at university, and I was amazed to see that the level of detail that they would go to, first of all, the skills that they had to know. So they needed to know, you know, engineering, studied math. They, they needed to know aesthetic uh, design. They needed to understand material strengths and weaknesses. In a similar way, I think in IT, the designer of an IT system will have to understand you know, the capabilities of, of storage, of networking, of, of certain shapes and designs. So, so the network, the CLOS network architecture, you can imagine that being analogous to the sort of frameworks that we used to build skyscrapers today. You, you build a skeleton and then you hang your infrastructure on that skeleton. So we'll probably be looking for those patterns which can be reused. And I don't know if any of the audience actually saw somebody had, had read my book, In Search of Certainty. In that book, I, I try to make this analogy between material science and IT. Just because as the scale of things grows to you know, gargantuan proportions, it, IT infrastructure starts to look like an atomic substance and going from single atoms to a sheet of metal. I mean, it's, it's that kind of scale now that we're talking about. Or if you like, going from a single cell to a tissue. And when you scale in that way, you then start to have to think about how do I replicate things? How do I differentiate things? How do I get the throughput in my design to cope with the load? Is this a load-bearing? Um, Docker instance or <laughs> you know a load bearing configuration. So I think that one of the key roles is, is much more that architect and the understanding of the materials available. And I suspect we'll see the materials themselves advance and change uh, just as they have done in you know, in the mechanical um, engineering industry. And so we'll. I mean, it's interesting to think about how IT might eventually start to look more like the history of mechanical engineering as the rules change. So if you're a bricklayer, study town planning. Is that correct? You want to be a town planner. And the, the other idea is, with, it's interesting you mentioned Docker and and this whole concept of containers, um, you know, and, and how that sort of maps to configuration management, uh, and how does that impact, you know, conf configuration ma management? Is that just sort of a broader or a higher level uh, abstract sort of view of, of configuration management? That's a great question because it, it does kind of change the way that goes to the point I made about tenancy, you know, where do you put things and how do you, how do you package them up or where do you locate uh, things. When even five, six, or well, more than that now, so nearly ten years ago when Solaris introduced their containers uh, and zones in, you know, in Solaris 10, line 10, uh, we were using CF Engine to, to build hosts inside these zones in a very effective way. Um, this is now starting to come to Linux. And the real innovation, I think, that Docker adds to this is not so much the containers, but the 
the version system that they, they're using to quickly construct images. Because that gives you a different sort of creative tool, which is more of a manual paintbrush uh, tool. It's more of a craftsman approach than it is an automation approach. But that too, in this world of uh, human-driven experience, is becoming a force to be reckoned with. So one of my favorite books is Alvin Toffler's third, uh, third Wave, in which he talks about the third wave being this, this age in which everybody is creative and has sort of huge diversity, variation of products and services that we have at our disposal. And um, the ability to deliver and design all of those variations depends very much on the ability to uh, get small teams uh, functional very quickly. I think this is something that the container model is almost reverting to a manual approach of creating uh, the configurations. Um, allow and, and also the microservices approach of scaling. Both of these kind of put the control back into the developer's hands rather than the automation to get content delivered uh, very quickly. There's still a role for the, automate, the automated uh, configuration management on the, the back end, the decentralized delivery mechanism. And even inside containers, though there's some contention about this in, in the industry, but I still believe that you know, a fast configuration system like CF Engine works can still have a role to play in maintaining and repairing things that go on inside containers much more quickly than they could be maintained from the outside through a resource manager. Uh, and also, if you look at those uh, smart billboards, the embedded devices, all the Teslas around the world, you know, all of the cars and, and devices currently using IT, they're all going to need managing. And that configuration will be in smaller packages, perhaps. But it will the, the need for it is still there. But it's definitely being affected by the way we're packaging applications and resources. Excellent. So back to sort of the autonomy, uh, the provision management, sort of weakly coupled. Yes, exactly. Uh, oh, Mark, any other questions? Well, well we've had a lot of questions come in, Mark, uh, that I would say are more technical questions about configuration management and CF Engine in particular. So, Mark, maybe we could get someone on your team and we'll get those answered and sent out to people after the webcast. Does that make sense? That sounds like a great idea. I'd be happy to do that. Okay. And I did want to throw in one question here for people who want to stick on. Uh, Ross uh, asked it twice. So um, in the Internet of Things, Mark, he's wondering, you know, you've got these low compute devices, uh, small devices. How are those going to be? In, in his lingo, he says, how do you implement promise bundles into those devices? A promise bundles is a CF engine um, concept, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point. But uh, just remember that uh, those tiny embedded devices are still more powerful than the mainframes of <laughs> 20 years ago. So it's really not a huge deal. We actually have CF Engine running on Raspberry Pis and, and tiny little uh, gumstick computers as well. Uh, it, it's perfectly possible. Obviously, you change your mindset a little bit as to how much you need to manage a system. Uh, if you look at developments like core OS and stripped down versions of operating systems that are solely, even Android, um, iOS, those operating systems that are designed to be stripped down to support the application and just what you need to run the application. There's certainly an argument that operating systems themselves will become more like that, more stripped down, much lighter weight, leaner, uh, to enable uh, the management to not sort of choke off the application resources. We spend too much, far too much effort and resources overhead on management today. All right, well, we have uh, gone a bit past the top of the hour, so I want to uh, wrap up. And uh, Mark Burgess, I want to thank you so much for your very enlightening, uh, insightful presentation. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure our attendees did as well. Mark Levy, thank you for 
interjecting in there and sharing your thoughts. We do have a number of questions that came in that we didn't get a chance to answer, so we'll follow up um, with Mark's help and get those answered and out to you. So uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, once again, look for a invite to our next uh, DevOps drive-in topic around continuous testing. And uh, while I have you, I want to let you know that if you don't know already about Serena, uh, we have a deployment automation uh, product that fits very nicely into the continuous delivery tool chain. And we have a free version that's available to get you started. And it's on your screen now. Just go to serena.com slash SDA. Serena Deployment Automation to learn more, and we'll certainly put a link in our follow-up email about that. Thank you all for attending. Have a uh, fantastic rest of the week. Happy Halloween to you, and uh, next uh, time we'll talk about Thanksgiving.